Ah, uh, good morning, everybody. Let's talk about being crazy today. Seems to be a predominant uh, manner of thinking across the United States for most people. That dude is crazy. What he did was crazy. She's crazy. Oh, my gosh, my ex is just crazy. My mom and dad are crazy. They're so mental. Everyone's crazy. Well, how do we get out of that? Well, see, a lot of the time... <laughs> That means here comes an avalanche of bullshit, in case you didn't know. This is the thing I'm working on. I may have found a solution to help us navigate the troublesome terrain of mental health. And it uh, resides right here in our... Once again, it's right here in our lore. So if you would care to stick around and pay attention, there's a one or two things I might be able to point out here to will allow me, in the, in the words of Captain Jack Sparrow, allow me to lend the machete to your intellectual thicket. There comes a point in the life of a person when there seems to be too much information about what they have done in life, what they be, and they become absorbed in their own thoughts. Well, it may be good if you're a scientist or a spiritualist, uh, but not if you're simply trying to live life. Now, we have found a way to feed that all-consuming thought process by subscribing to social media. And we get wrapped up in our own thoughts. We get on social media, and we'll find people across the world to feel and think the same way we do. All of a sudden, we're right. We're okay. We don't need to change anything. Right. <laughs> it's a platform which keeps our minds operating in that same mode of thought, all about ourselves. That's good and that's bad because, you know, if you're not the most important thing in your world, who else is going to make you important in their world? So, see, we are feeding our various neuroses steroids, it would seem, with social media. It seems to be working the Instagram. See, I have pointed out in the past that Loki most resembles that state of mind, one which is centered around himself and all of his actions seem to produce results which backfire on himself and everyone around him. I had the best intentions. Uh-huh. It's a tale of personal gain, backstabbing, and the use of women as trophies. Read it, you'll see. Until he must rely upon one to keep the poisons of his own actions from burning his face, and she is the one who literally helps him to save face. It is a neurotic existence, and one which mirrors so much the mind and actions of men and women today, recognizing it is our first step towards changing it. And I've changed a lot of things, but every time I drink one of these, people start whining. That's going to kill you. That stuff is so bad for you. Dude, do you have any idea the amount and quantity and variety of stuff I've put in my body and come out of it? feel pretty good about a little Red Bull. I think I'll be all right. <laughs> on any given day, therapists will sit down with all kinds of people and try to start serious work on helping these folk to unlearn some behaviors that they have learned. Ones which have caused them enough pain to want to do something about it. There you go. It's not a hard task. A lot of people go through it. The first thing a trained professional will do is try to ascertain if the problem is a problem, if the problems a person is trying to deal with are personality traits or character adaptations. At the negative end of personality traits, there is an area people tend to refer to as neuroticism. This is where we determine how thin-skinned someone is with regards to life. <laughs> it's becoming thinner with these uh, snowflakes of today. Are they a warrior? Does their anger tend to flash? Uh, are they consistently down in the dumps and often overreact? Uh, does stress eat their lunch, so to speak? See, a person like that is a good, promising bet for a professional. They'll, the professional will have some success along with the individual. Those are the types of issues in life people can find a way out of relatively easy. They will be the, um, they'll be the first to make use of the meme, so to speak. And they probably made the meme as they've gone through all this and come out the other side. You see them all the time. And it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It shows growth. It shows somebody's doing something to try to be something better. I'm all for it. <laughs> these are the shortcomings in handling life most easily recognized and addressed by faith it says it right here in the half of them all the witless man is awake all night thinking of many things care worn to see when the morning comes and his woe is just as it was hell yeah it is yeah he's tired to boot <laughs> these people 
Given enough support or desire to make a change, have what it takes to make use of the various stanzas compiled in the Havamal to better their life. Or any other religion for that matter. I don't care if they use them the whatever other holy book they decide to take a look at. There's something in there to give them example to move forward. Virtue, see, see, they have what it takes to utilize things like the nine noble virtues as tools to make their lives better. They can overcome their maladaptive patterns to enjoy a much better life. Character traits, on the other hand, are descriptions of the way in which people adapt to specific situations, including their environment. These are fear-based, maladaptive coping strategies, and we may or may not be aware we are even doing them. But the end, end result is that they are separating us from our long-term goals. See, they have what it takes to overcome. They, too, have what it takes to overcome these patterns of overt behavior if given sufficient incentive. Their actions are behaviors designed to remedy stress, and create some kind of security in their personal arena. And I'll give you two guesses of what two types of people have to deal with that the most. They may well include drink. They um, their actions are behaviors designed to remedy stress in their personal area. I'll repeat that. That might include driving everyone away, or it may be as complicated as smoking or drinking in excess. In the short term, yeah, it's going to happen with some people, college parties, bars, even New Year's Eve. But the long-term damage is catastrophic, to say the least. It's life-ending, to say the least. Uh, the smoking, the drinking, the drugs, all that stuff, pushing people away. Um, these behaviors become, in essence, rituals. And they become the patterns which run our lives. And no amount of well-worded spiritual literature will do anything about it. And that's, that's, that sucks. Is that, that, that suggests to us that we might have to actually do some work. We might have to change our thought process to become something more. And that's a, that's a bitch. <laughs> ex-military and ex-cons each face a stumbling block along these lines. They have each developed patterns of behavior designed to survive the environment they exist in. Both of them have the potential to be savage. They have. They both have the opportunity to engage in excessive violence at the behest of others. They make observations. They formulate ideas which they believe will result in the safety of their being. And just like the fish, which makes observations about life, about just like the fish, which makes observations and lives its life comfortably in his bowl. But see, now they're no longer in their bowl. Now they're like a fish out of water. They become confused and disoriented and some, sometimes downright angry that those rules they lived by no longer work. No one's immune to it, this experience. By varying degrees, when men, men and women get divorced, they also deal with a similar set of emotions. When people lose a loved family member, the rules of their life also change. There is a period of grief, which is accurately diagrammed. All of these are patterns in life. They're all well documented. Professionals make a good living out of helping people through these difficult times. How has science upended faith in dealing with the most basic problems of the heart? By convincing us that the problems reside within our minds. It's all what you're thinking. There are many pills available which will change the thoughts of a person, soften the blow, so to speak. Perhaps so much that the therapy will help you work through these painful times of uncertainty and transition. What we must ask ourselves at this crossroads is, will this faith, also true, help us navigate those same issues? Will it be a benefit to its adherents? Can we find the same type of powerful analogies in our lore concerning the mental and emotional health people are in need of? In some respects, I have addressed this in Eager's Feast where I outline how the assembled host may well represent our assembled thoughts, ideas, and emotions, which help to outline our thinking processes, as well as our minds. Well, I won't go into a great depth about the book here. The concept is an impressive one. Hell yeah, it is, because I wrote it. When all of the gods and goddesses take their seats in the medium of water to brew a mead in a cauldron of cosmic proportions, I make the suggestion that this is a representation of our minds. 
not the brain per se, but the overall idea of our mind. When we get our thinking processes in order and create a mindset where the Aesir and Aesir, all of the good representations of all the good aspects of our of love, of kindness, of friendship, of, of solidarity, of loyalty, of integrity, all get together in our mind to help us become something better. Uh, represented as the Aesir and the Asian year, all it takes is one bad egg to screw it all up. One bad negative thought. And just like our own thinking, we might be enjoying a wonderful day full of joyous happenstance and love and out of the blue, unbidden and unwelcome. The training we have all undergone as children will usher in that one negative thought. Do I deserve this? When will the other shoe drop? What's the catch? This is too good to be true. And just like that, our own thinking process ruins what might have been a good thing for us. We rob ourselves of the future we are built for. And Eager's Feast provides a remarkable platform for many people to step into the next stage of their faith and indeed their own life if they can figure it out. <laughs> but there's another one. And that's the thing about the Lord. These things are told to us again and again through these stories. People don't want to pay attention. Oh, that's a really neat story about a tree. Do you really think a story about a tree is going to stick around for thousands of years if it's just a story about a tree? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me the name of the bestseller uh, on the New York Times list five years ago? Probably not. Here we have a story that's continued to stick around for a long time. Might want to take another look at it. That's what we're going to do here. Powerful symbol which is under constant attack. Kind of like us. One which the entire universe is set within. That symbol of strength and success is you. It is described in the lore as a great ash, though I believe that more and more people are figuring out that there was something lost in the translation and Yggdrasil is actually a yew tree. Feel free to research that all you wish. I think you'll come up with the same conclusion. The oldest tree in Wales is a yew tree, and it is in a churchyard. One of them is 5,000 years old, and there is at least one church that I know of which is actually inside the yew tree in France. Yew trees have been considered holy places for some time across Europe. But again, I digress. Let's get back to handling the neuroses which have developed from expecting develop from everyone expecting someone or something else to handle our life for us. The problems, resentments, bad feelings, and confusion which results from this state of mind has had a long-term crippling effect on the mental health of mankind. We shall, everybody's sitting here dealing with this kind of pain, and everybody's kind of hoping, when is somebody going to help me? When is somebody going to help me deal with this? Where is that God you know, when the Romans burnt J Jerusalem to the ground, those priests hid in the bottom of that temple and waited on their God to do something, and nothing happened. If they'd have picked up a sword and used the gifts they had, they might have had a little bit better chance. Let's get back to Yggdrasil. <laughs> that, where is the chief holy place? That is the Ash of Yggdrasil. So the chief holy place... The Ash of Yggdrasil, if we think about Yggdrasil's feast and the gathering place of our own mind of the gods, now this is the chief holy place all of a sudden becomes us. It's no accident that one of them's name is Ve, and our holy places are all named a Ve. Our bodies are also a representation of that. <laughs> what is to be said concerning the place? The ash is greatest of all trees and, and best. Its limbs spread out all over the world and stand above heaven. Three roots of the tree uphold it and stand exceedingly broad. One is among the Aesir. Another among the rhyme giants, and in that place where a fourth time was the yawning void, the third stands over Niflheim. And under that root is Vergelmir, and Nidhogger gnaws the roots from below. But under that root, which turns upward, the rhyme giants is Mimer's well, wherein wisdom and understanding are stored, and he is called Mimer. Why would wisdom be stored with the, those passionate and base beings, the giants? Hmm, it's a pickle. And he is called Mimer, who keeps the well. He is full of ancient lore, since he drinks of the well from the Gallarhorn. Thither came all father and craved one drink of the well. So on and so forth, he gave it up. Poked out an eye. 
The third root of the ash stands in heaven, and under that root is the well which is very holy. That is called the well of Erder, where the gods hold their tribunal each day. The Asir right thither over, up over Bifrost, Bifrost past judgment. Very basic outline. You got a tree at three roots. They all support one aspect of the tree. Let's take a look at that. What's that look like? What more importantly, it's good to know all that shit. What's it going to help us move forward in life as? That's the key question. I was looking at a book the other night, and if somebody was like, you need to read this book because it's fantastic, and I'm opening it up, and it's a it's a damn college white paper on the history and all of it. I'm like, what does that do for us? I'm so sick of picking up a book to read it, and it's a it's a white paper argument about some kind of archaeological understanding that we might have of the heathen worldview. What? There's no interest. Thousands of people are adhering to this faith. They're not interested in reading a white paper. They want someone to tell them, hey, take a look at it like this, so they might move forward and figure it out on their own from there. <laughs> we also have a structure with three very important components. Each root terminates in a location that corresponds with one of the three important aspects of our being. One is among the Aesir with its corresponding well Urd. It is an exceptionally holy place, and for our purposes, this represents the mind, the literal crown of our existence. The second root of the tree terminates with the giants, and I have long contended that the giants, from which the gods originate, represent beings who act upon their impulses to satisfy base needs. Um, they are symbolic of the powerful heart, the passionate arguments, the ego-driven behaviors, the that root has the most famous well, Memer's well, and it contains wisdom beyond comprehension. So valuable it is that Odin sacrificed an eye to understand what amounts to the limbic resonance of everyone. Those are the calculations which would allow a being to know the future by understanding how people are going to act and react. He sacrificed an eye to know these things, and there's an argument to be made that Heimdall sacrificed an ear to see all these things. The Gallarhorn means yelling horn, an instrument much like the one people would hold to their ears in the olden days. It also resides in the members' well, along with Odin's eye. One eye, one ear, and the supernatural structure containing lagoos for the universe. Interesting dynamic there. But what is limbic resonance? Limbic resonance is the capacity to share deep emotional states. These states include the dopamine circuit promoted feelings of empathic harmony, and the neoepinephrine circuit originated emotional states of fear, anxiety, and anger. Why, if you could understand that about everyone, you might really understand how people are going to do things. That's the Wikipedia definition. I assure you that if you understand that about people, you can accurately predict any number of scenarios concerning any individual. Law enforcement calls it profiling. It is such a precise state that they use it to determine everything from marketing, store layouts, sales, voter patterns, so on and so forth. There are entire university programs for learning such things. Now, the third root is confusing, primarily because it is in Niflheim. Under this root lays the literal fountain of all waters, Vrogelmir. This root represents the body, literally the material, the actual components of the structure that houses the heart and mind what has composted to provide essential nutrients for the cycle of life. When all three of them are combined, we have a powerful reminder of what Odin, Vili, and Vey created to begin with, a tree which has been shaped to support a universe. Our nervous system resembles in many aspects that of a root system supporting a crown, and every single person is responsible for their own universe. They are responsible for the thoughts they think, the feelings they feel, and the material they use to build their bodies. The creatures which inhabit this tree are reminiscent of the situations we must deal with every single day, and it is pointed out as simply as it can be. At the bottom of the tree, there lies a dragon, Nidhogg, one who gnaws the root of the tree incessantly, along with a literal sea of serpents who are numbered beyond count. At the top, there is an eagle with a far-seeing hawk on his nose, and there's a squirrel which runs back and forth, relaying messages to irritate the dragon and the eagle. What's up, Sammy? The eagle and the hawk are looking forward. That's what we're supposed to be doing, isn't it? Those high-minded thoughts we all appreciate when observing some great sight in the world, or maybe the next world, or perhaps 
even those dreams and memories which bring a smile to our face and warm our hearts. The hawk views it from a different angle, providing additional input, reminding us not to take our eye off the prize, constantly in our face to keep us focused in the right direction. The dragon is that aspect of ourselves which establishes dis-ease. Gnawing doubt and those concepts which undermine our very being. The ideas which cripple our ability to become what we can become. Those serpents are any one of a multitude of poisonous thoughts we have been programmed to bring into our thinking process the moment we find ourselves in strange new territory. Those thoughts of doom and gloom appear when we find ourselves living in a manner not congruent with the manner in which we were raised. And it does so on both sides of the coin. If we regress and actively deny all the instruction we have been given in our growing up to become the rebel, the outlaw uh, in a society, we feel these, these serpents. Those serpents eat at us every time we lay our heads down to get some rest. Shouldn't have done that. Man, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> they and the dragon gnaw at the foundation of our being. In a painful twist of reality, those negative thoughts only further serve to ensure that our future will be a bleak one indeed. And change your future, change your mind. The other side of the coin is when you move past the spiritual development of the environment you grew in, like many of us. Or if you change it altogether. It can be very tough to identify and rid oneself, or at the very least, properly put the thoughts into the perspective they deserve. It is in both of these arenas where we find great difficulty in developing beyond our current state of affairs. No one believes it is possible, do they? We expect a miracle. Once again, something we have been taught. If there is not some kind of sign from the divine, how can it possibly be real? And here is where that angle I was talking about. The hawk is always in the angle. Our minds and the direct connection to the divine they possess offer us the miraculous possibility to be rid of these thoughts, our own thoughts, which are paralyzing our ability to live well in this world. Once we shed or sacrifice our ego so that we might learn the runes and the songs of our ancestors. In case no one has noticed, this is exactly what we are doing in the faith of also true. You can't tell me that no one that jumps into this with both feet doesn't feel like he has to eat a little crow every time somebody says, well, what do you believe in? Well, I believe in faith in the old gods and somebody snickers at them. There's the death of a little bit of an ego in that, force feeding of humble pie. A lot of people like to deny it. Now, it's not it's becoming more and more comfortable to say, I'm also true. People look at you and usually they're scared. <laughs> but we're shedding a little bit of our ego there, forcefully. It's being done. It's being whittled away so we might become something more. We have found ourselves at a place in life where we may not be as important as we always thought we were. And in that quiet moment, we remember the songs, the love, the words of encouragement from family members long since past, and we're learning the runes, aren't we? The process is such an integral part of Austria that the ceremony of Sambal is a foundational aspect of our ceremonial life. It is a formula. The first round is to a god or goddess we are feeling connected to. The second round is about one of our ancestors that helped make us great. The third round, and because of the association with the first and the second, is what we are becoming today. All of this should be having the effect of pulling out, pulling us out of our own thoughts to show us a new path, a new freedom, and a new life. One we can address with the power of a positive thinking process. Thinking along the lines of what the Aesir and the Vanir represent. This is the kind of thinking which an eagle perched high in a tree might most appreciate as it watches the sunrise on a beautiful day or watch the sunset on a far horizon, a horizon which has tremendous potential for us all. The squirrel ratatosk in this day and age might as well be on steroids. It is carrying those doubts you were taught to believe all your life to the crown of <laughs> the crown of your being telling you, no, you can't, just like in Mega Mind. You got them posters everywhere. No, you can't. I love that damn thing. It gets run off by the hawk or the eagle, heads down the trunk to the dragon to tease him a little bit and back up, back and forth. Who knows if he even understands the damage he is causing to the tree? Who knows if he cares? 
but his actions are as automatic as the tug of war in your own thought process between victim and ego. Good thoughts and negative thoughts, picking his way along the tree the same way he has done for years because this is the path he knows, like the back of his hand. And so do your own thoughts. And in a perverse act of evolution, there is a biochemical response to any and all of these thoughts. Your body doesn't know what your mind is, that what your mind is thinking isn't really happening. It will flood the body with chemicals necessary to handle whatever situation you are remembering or anticipating. Carry those painful memories and remember them 20 times a day, every day for 5, 10, or 30 years, and it will have a negative effect on your body. We begin to give ourselves diseases. Ratatosk is the unending cycle of thinking <laughs> we do in accordance with the uh, it's the it's the thinking we do in accordance with the programming of the day overlaid with our own good and bad memories. It is an automatic existence we need to be learning to free ourselves from back and forth, up and down, round and round. We think ourselves into an early grave from suicides, drug overdoses, certain cancers, stress-related diseases, on and on it goes. When you change your thoughts, you will first change your reality by eliminating those self-imposed prisons on your own being. The program of our day, the propaganda which tears us down, are represented by the four hearts gnawing at the tree. It may as well just be pollution of our earth, skies, and waters, but there may stand for any external stressor on the body we have no control over, just as our just our thoughts about it. These are the dews which drip in the dale, and it is here where the divine once again give us a tremendous nudge. I appreciate y'all joining me today. That's kind of what I got so far. I'm going to put some more work into this because I think it's a really good subject, a really good idea. Um, I'll get it all fleshed out and get it published, and it's going to come out top notch and A number one. I be fantastic. I look forward to sharing more with you. Thanks for joining me here this morning. Y'all have a great day.